Welcome to the Four Dimensions of Service Management module. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe the four dimensions of service management. The Four Dimensions of Service Management To support a holistic approach to service management, ITIL defines four dimensions that collectively are critical to the effective and efficient facilitation of value for customers and other stakeholders in the form of products and services. Organisations have only a finite amount of resources available to them in the pursuit of value, and they seek to ensure that they make the most effective and efficient use of these resources. The ITIL SVS is an operating model that describes the ways in which the various components and activities of an organisation work together to create value. In the development and continual improvement of an SVS, Organisations must think holistically, considering all components and the relationships and interdependencies that exist between them. For example, planning process improvements without considering the impact on people, partners and supporting technology is only likely to lead to disappointment and wasted effort. To support a holistic approach to service management, ITIL defines four dimensions that collectively are critical to the effective and efficient operation of the SVS. These are organisations and people, information and technology, partners and suppliers, value streams and processes. These dimensions do not have sharp boundaries and there may be overlap, but all of the components of the SVS are shared among these four dimensions. These four dimensions apply to all aspects of the SVS, including governance, service value chain and practices, as well as to all services being managed. Students familiar with PESEL analysis might recognise the list of factors that encircle the four dimensions. These are external factors which can impact positively or negatively on the performance of an individual or group of components, on a dimension or on the SVS as a whole. As with the four dimensions, the edges between these different factors are not sharp and often blur. For example, Technological advances in recent years have had a social impact to the extent that customers, more and more, expect to be able to access services remotely while on the move. For some service providers, for example, those who already have the skills and resources to offer these types of services, this will be an opportunity to capitalise on their existing strengths to add more value to their services. For other organisations, less able to respond to these changing external factors, there may be a threat of being left behind. Whereas organisations will seek to understand internal components in order to build on their strengths and address their weaknesses, they should also seek to understand external factors in order to exploit opportunities and minimise threats as they arise. The first dimension to consider is organisation and people. This dimension ensures that the culture, roles and responsibilities Resourcing and competency requirements, formal organisational structures and systems of authority support the organisation's strategy and operating model. Maximising the potential of the workforce is one of the biggest challenges facing an organisation. It is partly about having the right people with the right skills in the right place doing the right things. So an organisation must ensure that the way it is structured and managed as well as its roles, responsibilities and systems of authority and communication is well defined and supports its overall strategy and operating model. Every person in the organisation needs the specific skills and competencies required to fulfil their responsibilities, but also should have a clear understanding of how they contribute to the creation of value for the organisation, its customers and other stakeholders. Additionally, they should have a broader awareness and appreciation of the roles and contributions of other individuals and groups within the organisation. This encourages the proper levels of collaboration and coordination. Maximising workforce potential is also about creating an environment and a culture that encourages the desired behaviours and inspires and motivates people day after day to bring their best efforts to work. The leaders of the organisation need to develop appropriate management and leadership skills and styles and should model the attitudes and behaviours the organisation desires in the workforce. A culture of trust and transparency, communication and collaboration 
and a focus on value and continual improvement will help any organisation which strives to achieve and maintain high performance while responding to ever-changing internal and external drivers. Adopting the ITIL guiding principles is a good starting point for establishing a healthy organisational culture. The second dimension of service management is information and technology. As with the other three dimensions, information and technology applies both to service management and to the services being managed. There is a need to identify and manage each of the individual technical components, as well as to be able to visualise and understand the infrastructure as a complex whole with its myriad of connections and dependencies, inputs and outputs. Examples of information and technologies which support service management include Workflow management systems. These are tools which can streamline and automate common business processes, such as incident management or change management. Inventory systems. Tools that allow an organisation to track and manage physical components, such as hardware and software. Knowledge bases. Tools that support the capture, storage and sharing of valuable information and knowledge, such as a known error database. Examples of information and technologies which support the services themselves include IT architecture, the many layers of hardware and software that create the infrastructure across which the service is delivered, applications, the program or group of programs that provide the functionality required by the user to achieve their outcomes, databases, the repositories where data is held in a secure, organised and usable way. In the context of an IT service, the information created and used in the course of service consumption is the primary means of value enablement. For each service, the service provider should consider both the information requirements of the service, for example, confidentiality, retention and disposal, and the information and knowledge needed to be able to manage and deliver the service. Information often flows through an organisation passing from one service to another. Service providers need to understand the information architecture and data flows of the various services from this broader perspective in order to continually optimise it. On top of all this, organisations need to consider the requirements to comply with any internal policies or external standards or regulations, such as the European Union's General Data Protection Regulations, GDPR. Various factors may influence an organisation's choices in the technologies it uses. For example, some organisations may seek advantages in being at the cutting edge of technological advances. Other organisations may be constrained by the requirements of clients or regulators. Other considerations include questions such as, does this technology align with the strategy of the organisation? Is it compatible with the current architecture of the organisation and its customers? Will it continue to be viable for the foreseeable future? Does the organisation have the skills to support the technology? Does the technology introduce new risks or constraints to the organisation? The third dimension of service management is partners and suppliers. This dimension encompasses an organisation's relationships with other organisations that are involved in the design, development, deployment, delivery, support and or continual improvement of services. In business today, it would be rare indeed to find an organisation that doesn't depend, to some extent, on product or services provided by other organisations. This dimension is concerned with partners and suppliers who are involved in the activities of the service value system. As discussed earlier in the course, a single organisation may be involved in many different relationships, both as a supplier and a consumer. These relationships can vary hugely in terms of their formality and the degree of integration required of the two organisations. The table shown on screen offers three examples but these are intended only to serve as an illustration of what is really a wide spectrum of possibilities. In the example of good supply relationship, there is little flexibility or close working required. The supplier delivers product under contract that the supplier uses for its own purposes. Typically, at this level of cooperation, 
the service provider seeks value by supplying the same product to multiple consumers. The consumer in this relationship typically sees value in a reliable, timely and cost-effective supply. Relationships at the other end of the spectrum require both parties to be much more flexible and responsive in their approach and work together in a more close and integrated way in order to identify and co-create value. One of the challenges an organisation faces when it uses multiple suppliers is establishing a proper spirit of collaboration and cooperation. Many organisations are starting to favour a service integration and management approach. This involves creating a service integrator role which sits above all suppliers and ensures that service relationships are properly coordinated. The service integrator role itself can be internally or externally sourced, but proper controls need to be put in place to ensure it operates with fairness, impartiality and integrity. An organisation's strategy for how it chooses to work with partners and suppliers will be affected by many factors including strategic focus, corporate culture, resource scarcity, cost concerns, subject matter expertise, external constraints and demand patterns. The fourth dimension, value streams and processes, is concerned with how the various parts of the organisation work in an integrated and coordinated way to enable value creation through products and services. A value stream is a series of steps that an organisation uses to create and deliver products and services to a service consumer. It is a combination of the organisation's value chain activities. Earlier in the course, when considering the components of the service value system, we saw that the central component was called the service value chain. This is where all of the key activities required to manage products and services actually happen. We will come back to look at this in more detail later in the course, but you can see it consists of a number of major activity areas, such as engage, plan and obtain or build. Depending on the nature of the demand entering the service value chain, these activities will be triggered in different sequences and not all activities will be required in all situations. For example, the demand could be a user requesting support because they're unable to connect to a service. This might be completed in three steps. Step 1. The call is logged as an incident by the service desk. This is an engage activity. Step 2. The incident passes to a second line engineer who resolves the issue. This is an activity of deliver or support. Step 3. The desk confirms with the user that he is now able to access the service. This is an engage activity. These three steps comprise the value stream, the pattern for how this type of demand is fulfilled. At the other extreme, a customer requirement for the creation of a major new service will trigger a much more complicated sequence of steps. Each activity in the service value chain will be triggered at some point during this value stream sometimes more than once, and in some cases in parallel with other activities. The picture on the slide is a somewhat simplified representation of what this stream will actually look like. In practice, it is likely to be far more complex and involve many more steps. This, in fact, is one of the strongest reasons for mapping value streams. It provides clarity, enabling the organisation to apply techniques such as lean and agile to improve its efficiency and effectiveness. For example, removing or improving steps that don't add value, or identifying steps in the value stream where rationalisation or the use of automation could improve the flow of work. An organisation should aspire to map all of its value streams. However, the more complex or high value streams are likely to offer the most significant opportunities for improvement, so this might be a good place to start. A process is described as a set of interrelated or interacting activities that takes one or more inputs and transforms them into one or more outputs. They define the sequence of actions necessary to accomplish an objective. For example, an incident management process describes the steps involved in restoring normal service following an outage or degradation. The input which triggers this process will be a description of the symptoms, 
usually provided by a user speaking to a service desk agent. The activities of the process include the logging, investigation, analysis and restoration of service. And the outputs are a service restored to normal operation and a completed incident record. Detailed instructions and guidance for each step is normally documented in supporting procedures and work instructions. In many respects, value streams and processes are similar, but they should not be confused. They provide different perspectives and accomplish different things. The value stream is the entire path through the service value chain to deliver product or service to the customer. At each step of the value stream, one or more processes may be executed. So, to use the simple example shown earlier, although incident management is involved in each step of this particular value stream, the stream gives clarity that other processes are also being executed. For example, when resolving the incident at step 2 of the value stream, the engineer may need to access and update information held in a configuration management database. Well done, you've completed this module. Now try the following exercises to check your